Who's ready to learn? Who's ready to learn? All right, so you want to be a front-end developer? Are you aware that that's what this class is, basically, front-end development with React? Cool. So what does that even mean? Front-end, back-end, that kind of thing? Or to get e even more help from Google Images, I, I, I searched for uh, front-end developer, and what I discovered is that front-end developers make flat, pastel-colored things for desktops, laptops, and mobile devices. Sometimes they have logos floating around those devices. That's what front-end development is. Let's look at those, those little logos. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What do those three things have in common that they don't have in common with these? Which ones are front-end languages? Yeah, the ones on that side, right? So what's the difference? What do those have in common with each other that they don't have in common with these? How are they interpreted? Where do they run? What on earth am I talking about? Yes, sir. They run in the browser. That's what these rascals understand. They know just what to do with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They don't know what the cuss to do with those. Ruby, Python, PHP, .NET, and Java. So one possible definition of front end is that it consists of anything that web browsers can interpret without any extra help. If you want a more technical definition, the front end refers to things that run on the client, while back end refers to things that run on the server. Now, since we're writing stuff for the web, the web browser is the client. So it's anything that runs in a web browser. Uh, slow down there, Grandpa. What's this web business? We only know about the Snapchats and the Yik Yaks. Sound, the web sounds like something for people in their 30s. Gross. Well, what if I told you that your beloved Snapchats were served up on that very same infrastructure we call the World Wide Web? True story. So let's talk a little about how this so-called World Wide Web works. And pretty soon you'll be as comfortable with the web as this guy who thought his Palm Pilot bulky cell phone and 45-pound CRT displays would look cooler much longer than they did. He also thought he would have hair a little longer than he did. But anyway, so maybe don't listen to him. Or maybe do listen to him. Because it's me. It me. Anyway, when you visit a website, you type a URL into a browser or you type a search term or whatever, and it sends a request. That request goes off into that magical cloud we call the internet, or more specifically, the World Wide Web, where it eventually reaches a server or a cluster of servers or something. And that server does heaven knows what. It might just pull a file off a file system somewhere, or it might run an entire program written in Ruby or Java or PHP or Python or something like that. But whatever the server does, eventually it will send a response. And that response could be anything. It could be a zip file or an error page or something like that. But most of the time, it's going to be one of those three things, the things that web browsers understand natively. <clears throat> so again, the server might be running an entire program, and the output of that program might be HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, or a cat photo. But that's pretty much all there is out there, right? It could also be video or audio or something like that. But if your web page auto plays audio, you may as well be summoning the devil like our friend Spock here. I don't know. But it's probably HTML, CSS, JavaScript, a little bub. And only one of those things is a programming language. No, a little bub isn't a programming language. It's JavaScript, your new best friend. I told you I would overuse that. JavaScript. We're excited now, aren't we? So front-end development is building all the stuff that gets sent in the response. All the stuff that the web browser will interpret and display, including, yes, dear old JavaScript. So you want to learn more about JavaScript? Why? I have it on good authority that JavaScript is the worst. Look at this. 35.5 million results for JavaScript sucks. The first year I taught this, it was only 2 million. Last year, it was only 1.5. Now it's 35 and a half million results. Gosh, it must be really bad. And look down here. Casey, what's his face there is a 
self-described master programmer, and he doesn't mince words. Why do so many seem to hate, hate it? Because it sucks, obviously, right? S sucks so bad that there are 35 million pages devoted to its suckitude. So why use it? Reason number one, you don't have a choice. It's the only programming language that these things understand. If you want to do front-end programming on the web, uh, JavaScript is still the only game in town. Yes, you could use TypeScript or Dart or Elm or something like that, but only because those things are eventually translated into JavaScript. JavaScript is really the only game in town. But there's another reason. It's actually pretty good now. A lot of those Google results were actually pages like making fun of people for saying that JavaScript sucks simply because they don't understand it. Uh, there are a lot of developers who despise JavaScript, um, but in a lot of cases, it's just because it isn't whatever language they're comfortable with. They expect it to work like their language of choice, and it doesn't, and so it frustrates them. There were some unfortunate decisions made really early on in JavaScript's life that we still have to deal with uh, to some degree. Um, so there is some pain, and one of the most popular books about JavaScript is called JavaScript The Good Parts, and it's not very thick. But a lot of people just don't like it because it's not language X. For example, C on the left, Java on the right. JavaScript is also a curly braces and semicolons language. Um, but it doesn't actually, so it looks kind of like those. It even shares a name with one of them. But it doesn't actually work like those languages. And that can be very frustrating if you expect it to. And if you've been writing JavaScript since the late 90s like I have, you remember a time it was truly miserable to work with. Um, this was the first tweet that my business partner ever sent. Now that was two, 10 full years ago when hating JavaScript was a little more justifiable. And probably the truth is he hated it so much because it wasn't Ruby, which was his favorite language. Uh, I think even he would admit that now, although he's still very happy for me to write most of the JavaScript. So now that we've established how terrible it is, who's still excited to learn about JavaScript? Yeah, it'll be okay, I'm telling you. It's good now, guys. It's okay. So how did we get here? Come with me on a magical journey to a far-off land called 1989. The Berlin Wall came down. Nintendo released the Game Boy. Batman and Indiana Jones dominated the box office. And that was the last time anybody made an Indiana Jones movie. Yes, it was. <laughs> I still had hair. And at CERN Particle Physics Laboratory, future home of the Large Hadron Collider, this chap, Tim Berners-Lee, created the World Wide Web, and with it, the HTTP protocol and HTML. He created it for sharing scientific documents in hypertext, the HT in HTML. What's hypertext? It allows documents to link to one another, and that's still fundamentally what the web is. Only those linked documents can contain a lot more than just text, but in the beginning, there was only hypertext. So, 89. Fast forward a couple years to 1991, when they made the very last Terminator movie that anybody ever made. I still had hair. <gasps> hey, what am I playing there? Can anybody tell what I'm playing? It's an NES. What game? Can you see it up there? Ooh, close. Super Mario Brothers 3. I could have kept going. I could do the whole soundtrack. <laughs> yes, but anyway, the point is it was 1991. And good old Tim made his creation available to the world with a humble news group post. He launched it with a line mode browser that ran on pretty much anything, as well as a browser with a graphical interface and a built-in WYSIWYG editor. What's WYSIWYG? Who knows what WYSIWYG stands for? Nobody? What you see is what you get. In other words, it would show you a preview of what it would look like rendered, so you didn't just have to look at the source. Uh, that browser was called, cleverly, World Wide Web later renamed to Nexus. And it was written in Objective-C and ran on Next Step, 
the operating system for Next Workstations, the brainchild of this turtleneck wearing cusser who had been fired from Apple. But he would have his revenge. But Next computers were really friggin' expensive and not all that widely used. So the web still didn't really catch on. So in 1992, when I suddenly had long blonde hair, this guy told Tim he was thinking of writing a web browser for the X window system, which would allow it to run on a lot more Unix machines. And Tim said, good idea. So he made a new browser called, what? Viola, which you've never heard of. But yes, Viola, it added exciting new features like tables, embedding web pages and other web pages, a scripting language to add interactivity, a syntax for style sheets, all in all a huge leap forward, but it still only ran on Unix. So nobody used it. 1993, by which point I was the single most awkward organism on the planet. And the Legal Information Institute at Cornell had made the first website about law. And lawyers were like, it's a Unix system. I know this. No, just kidding. They were like, lol, what? And this guy was like, JK, LOL, I made a browser for Windows. And the lawyers were like, hype. And this new browser was called Cello. Get it? Viola, Cello? Yeah. Yes, Cello was the first web browser for Windows 3.1. This changed everything. Hey, web browsers, step forward if anyone remembers you. Yeah, no, not so fast, Cello. Because you see, at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois, birthplace of the fictional HAL 9000, these two, who were students at the time, developed a web browser of their own called... Mosaic! Woo! Who's heard of Mosaic? Eh, someone's kind of heard of Mosaic. All right, finally one we sort of heard of. Yes, Mosaic was a legitimately big deal. It was a graphical browser for Unix, but unlike Viola, it was very quickly ported to other operating systems, including Windows and Macintosh. And it was easy to install and use. Back in those days, it was rare for software to be easy to install. So that was a huge step forward. There were way more people interested in the web than ever before. So having something like Mosaic around really helped it catch on. In some respects, the evolution of the web actually took some steps backwards with Mosaic, whereas uh, Viola applied style via style sheets, not CSS, but their own style sheet syntax, um, keeping presentation separate from content and structure. Mosaic just added a bunch of new HTML elements like center and BR and B and U and HR and image and stuff like that. Just in time for 1994, when my nerdy friends and I still had hair, those other three jerks still do, and the information superhighway was all over the news. I know because Anderson Cooper told us all about it on Channel One. And it was time for people to start figuring out how to make money with it. So back at the NCSA where Mosaic was developed, um, the University of Illinois has uh, a company called Spyglass, which is a for-profit spinoff of the NCSA, which basically exists to make money from inventions from the university. So they made a commercial version of Mosaic. At the same time, however, Mosaic's original author had graduated and started a company, taking most of the Mosaic team with him. He called it Mosaic Communications until the NCSA called and was like, uh-uh, the Mosaic name's ours, buddy. So they gave their new version a code name, suggesting that their new browser was the Mosaic Killer. The Mosaic Killer. The Mosaic Killer. The Mosaic Killer. Say it with me. Mozilla! Woohoo! Hey, Uncle Dave, I've actually heard of that. That's right. Mark and his friends adopted Mozilla as their mascot. But the browser itself ended up being called... What? No. Netscape. Firefox was much later. Netscape Navigator was released in October of 94, implementing a ton of new features and very quickly rendering all other browsers irrelevant. So irrelevant that developers started inspecting the user agent string that gets sent with a request to make sure that it was Netscape. So remember the drawing with the, uh, the arrow sending your request? 
So obviously you have to send what URL you're requesting, but you also send along with that what browser you're using or what user agent you're using. And it sends a string like this. This was the string that Netscape 1 sent, Mozilla 1.0. Spyglass, meanwhile, was licensing their version of Mosaic to whom? Not to Paul Rudd. To Microsoft. Aw, oh, cuss. Player 3 has entered the game. That's right. So Microsoft put a team of six to work enhancing Spyglass Mosaic and giving it that Microsoft flavor. Which brings us to 1995, when my hair reached its maximum strength. And it looks like I did a cover shoot for Young Republicans Quarterly or something, but I don't remember that. So, 95. Turtle Neck Guy's other company made a movie about toys. Alanis Morissette was ticked off about one thing or another, and Bill Gates and his start menu were masters of the universe. So, Bill and his pals at Microsoft were ready to show their fork of mosaic to the world. You know it as... Yeah, come on. Yeah, Internet Explorer. A miserable pile of garbage available in the Microsoft Plus companion for Windows 95. At this point, IE was pretty much just Mosaic dressed up like Windows 95, uh, but the Netscape folks had been busy adding loads of new features. Internet Explorer didn't even support tables in the first release. They didn't even have that blue E icon yet. It was just that thing, and they just labeled it the Internet. And seriously, forget what you know about recent versions of Internet Explorer like IE 11 and certainly not Edge. The first two releases seriously had no redeeming qualities but everyone just used the browser that their ISP gave them on a floppy anyway, and that was virtually always Netscape. In fact, here's how Internet Explorer identified itself as Mozilla. And they put the truth in parentheses there, but there were so many people already sniffing out the user agent string trying to detect Netscape that every other browser maker just had to do that too. To this day, every browser user agent string just begins Mozilla. This is what they look like now. They just put everything in there. Mozilla, just in case someone's sniffing for Netscape. Apple WebKit, just in case someone's looking for um, Safari or a, a, a descendant thereof. KHTML, in case you're looking for Conqueror with a K. Gecko, in case you're looking for Firefox. Chrome, in case you're looking for that. Safari, in case you're looking more specifically than just WebKit. Edge, just in case. They all look like this now. It's ridiculous. This is actually the user agent string for Edge, by the way. So sniffing user agent strings, bad idea, folks. Detect features, not browsers, because you never know what's coming in the future. But there are so many ancient web pages still around that do this that everyone has to just put everything in their stupid user agent string. I know you were promised JavaScript. We're getting there. I promise. Just bear with me. So we're still in 1995, right? when Generation X was the ab absolute worst instead of you. So don't take it personally. They've always been doing it. They always hate the youth. Look at this. Killing America's soul. Laid back, late blooming, or just lost. Yep. We sucked before you did. So don't think you're anything special, kids. Well, that was also the year that the web became more widely available to mere mortals. And the commercial web was a very real thing. Amazon and Yahoo both launched that year. CNET launched with a yellow sidebar that every other site on the web decided they needed a copy. Seriously, you cannot imagine how ubiquitous that yellow sidebar was. People were very uncreative. The web was so ubiquitous that they even started making movies called Hackers. Check it out. Boot up or shut up. Online this fall. Get it? Online. So also, marketers have been trying super hard to seem hip to young people forever. So don't think you're anything special there either. So anyway, there were new tricks on the web, like tiled background images and GIFs, which were clearly a fad and have no place on the web today. But WebMonkeys wanted to add interactivity beyond hyperlinks and spinning X-wings. The answer came in the form of plugins like Java applets, QuickTime VR, and Macromedia Shockwave. Incredibly, Shockwave is still maintained by Adobe, and even more incredibly, the Space Jam website is still online. They only changed the URL to have archive in it last year. So we had interactive content, even games, in the web browser, but interactivity via browser plugins was still a pretty poor experience. The plugins had to be installed, they were a security risk, they were painfully slow, and they couldn't actually interact with the HTML elements on the page. Luckily, a team of scientists at Netscape 
were hard at work on a scripting language that would run directly in the browser. Okay, they weren't scientists. Okay, it was one dude, and he did it in 10 days. So what did he do in 10 days? You guessed it. He created Mocha. That's what his boss told him to tell, call it. He really, really wanted to remind people of that other new platform that was named after coffee. But a few months later, before they'd released it to the public, in September of 95, they came up with a better name. And finally, we had LiveScript. Okay, that didn't stick either. A couple months after that, Netscape worked out a deal with Sun Microsystems, who had created the trendiest new platform in town, Java. And thanks to this trademark licensing agreement, which confuses people to this day, Netscape could call their new language JavaScript. Despite having only the most superficial of similarities to Java. Yes, Java is to JavaScript what car is to carpet. Just a trademark licensing agreement. In any case, JavaScript now existed and could be used far and wide. At least by people who had the very latest version of Netscape and who had JavaScript turned on. But JavaScript had arrived. And in case that wasn't confusing enough, um, when Microsoft reverse engineered it the next year and added it to Internet Explorer, they called it JScript. They weren't going to mess with the trademark licensing business. So JavaScript and JScript. And over the next couple of years, an organization called ECMA, that's the European Country Music Association. No, I'm just kidding. It's the European Chamber Music Academy. No, no, it's the European Cylinder Makers Association. No, no, no. Obviously, it's Etude de Conception de Machine Automatique. No? Okay, okay. This joke has run its course. It's obviously the Electronic Collar Manufacturers Association. I mean, e East Coast Music Association. Canadian music, East Coast style. Huh? That's what I'm talking about. Okay, okay. It's ECMA International, a standards body called the European Computer Manufacturers Association. And over the next couple of years, they worked on standardizing JavaScript. And they called it... ECMAScript! Woo! So, for the last 20 years, ECMAScript has been the official standard of which JavaScript is the primary implementation. When we talk about the standard, it's ECMAScript. When we talk about the language, it's JavaScript. You may have heard of ES6, for example. ECMAScript 6, which was uh, the version where JavaScript greatly improved. Also called ECMAScript 2015. So now that we have our name straight, what could JavaScript actually do in those days? HTML could define the content on a web page and even its basic presentation. But JavaScript could dictate actual behavior. You could do real programming with it. You could use JavaScript to alter the contents of a page, even to generate additional HTML after the page is loaded. For example, you can make images that change when you hover your mouse over them. Bonus points if you had no idea what they link to until you hovered your mouse over them. Anyone want to guess what, what, what on earth page that goes to? I don't know. It's one of these. Probably off snow. It's not that one. Biosolid te soil testing? I have no idea. Mystery meat navigation. Bad idea. Um, that doesn't have my name on it, does it? No. I have no idea who would have created something so terrible. It's not online anymore. I found it on an external hard drive at my house. Don't know how it got there. But there we go. 1999 web design for you, folks. Or if you're a bank with a ridiculous skeuomorphic website design that looks like an ATM, you could offer a mortgage calculator right there on your page. This one also not online anymore. It's on my external hard drive. Don't know how it got there. But besides calculator and the ever-popular mouse over images, one of the handiest uses of JavaScript in those days was to validate form data before it was sent to the server. It was and is a great way to give people instant feedback without a round trip to the server. Say you ask for an email address and they type in something that doesn't have an at sign. You could catch that before wasting a trip to the server over someone's horrible 144K modem. It didn't and doesn't eliminate the need to check stuff on the server side. So in case you're ever tempted to validate in the browser only, think again. Nevertheless, client-side validation was great. But as with any new technology, there were those who would use JavaScript for the forces of evil. Yes, with JavaScript, the pop-up ad was born. Gee, thanks, JavaScript. Yes, everything was terrible. 
The web was becoming a nightmare, not just because of pop-up ads, but because an increasingly large number of sites only worked in one browser on one platform. In those days, Netscape and Internet Explorer didn't just compete on user interface features and cloud services and stuff like that. No one had ever invented that term yet. They added their own non-standard elements to HTML and other features besides. IE had Marquee. Netscape had Blink. Our lives were enriched. Competition had fostered such innovation. Nope, it was terrible. Both had significant market share and had developed wildly different document object models. Uh, object models, I should say. It was not the DOM. Um, IE had document.all. Netscape had document.layers. So if a site did anything so much as add a pull-down menu or something with JavaScript, it had to be written twice. You had to write everything twice. It was awful. Welcome to the first browser war. If you were really cool, you put nifty little buttons on your site to let people know what browser to download. But aside from different APIs for JavaScript, each browser had major features that were just plain absent in the other. Internet Explorer uh, 4.0 was bundled with Windows, um, which attracted the attention of the Department of Justice. Um, and it quickly became the single most widely used browser. But at least Spyglass was getting paid, right, since it was based on Mosaic? So the folks at the university, no, of course not. Since Microsoft bundled it with Windows for free, they didn't have to pay royalties. OK, so they did get sued, and they settled for 8 million lousy stinking bucks. But anyway, Internet Explorer began to dominate the market, and it introduced its own features, such as ActiveX. ActiveX allowed native compiled Windows code to run right in the browser. That obviously opened up a lot of possibilities, as long as you were willing to ignore every non-Windows user, which a lot of businesses were perfectly willing to do. So the web was starting to just become another plat delivery mechanism for Windows code. And uh, thanks to the fact that Outlook Express was also included in every copy of Windows, and it used the Internet Explorer engine to display messages, email could run native code just by previewing it. What could go wrong? Lots of crap went wrong. Lots of crap. Computer worms did billions of dollars in damage, and sometimes just previewing a message in your email client was enough to wreck everything. What were we talking about again? Oh, yeah, ActiveX. So why did companies use it since it broke the internet and was catastrophically insecure? Well, ActiveX did offer some enticing behavior, including one really neat thing that would eventually catch on and be adopted by other browsers in a pure JavaScript form. XML HTTP request, often called XHR. It made its debut in Outlook Web Access with Microsoft Exchange Server 2000, and it allowed a web page to get additional data from the server after page load without refreshing the entire page. Despite the name, it really had nothing to do with XML. It was just a mechanism for asynchronous requests. You may have heard of it by a different name. Uh, in 2005, Jesse James Garrett of the company Adaptive Path wrote a very influential blog post about a method for developing applications using XHR, and he called it Ajax. Anybody heard of Ajax? A few people? All right. Well, anyway, it was a big whoop to do. Um, but back in those days, if you wanted to do this stuff, it was different for every single browser. You had to do some, use some horrible DHTML library, um, which were terribly large downloads and very slow. Um, these were the bad days, folks. But in 2006, Several new JavaScript libraries that handled cross-platform compatibility in a much better way, uh, even Ajax, arrived. And these days, new challengers like Chrome and Safari have arisen, and they all do their best to implement standards and to keep themselves up to date. They even have nice built-in tools for developing JavaScript. And HTML5 offers new APIs that we can use with JavaScript to do some new things, as well as to do some old things faster. And JavaScript got a major overhaul with ECMAScript 2015, aka ES6 and it has continued to improve since then. We're not even gonna mess with ES5 or older in this course. We're gonna do all ES6 and later all the time. You're welcome, trust me. And we have about a million libraries and full-blown frameworks that let us build fancy JavaScript apps. Which one are we using in this class? React, yeah, that's the third one there, the atomic looking thing. Old versions of Internet Explorer remain the hardest for front-end developers to deal with as there are still a shocking number of computers running Windows XP. IE8, released eight years ago, was the last version to support XP, and those who never updated past uh, XP Service Pack 1 are still stuck with IE7. Uh, but 
that's a pretty small share now. And IE has even earned a bad enough rap that Microsoft dropped the name entirely, and they now call their browser, of course, Edge. But they're all mostly OK for our purposes. I'll be recommending Google Chrome for this class because I'm most familiar with its developer tools, and we're going to be using the developer tools a lot. So please use Chrome for the class so you can follow along. But uh, all the projects we build will work in the latest versions of any of the major browsers. So no one knows for sure what the future holds, but the future of front-end development looks pretty bright. So it's taken a while to get here, but it's a pretty exciting time to be creating things for the web, and JavaScript has never been better. Are you with me? Woo! Hot dog. Gonna write some gall dang code. But before we do,